finally the spookier time of the year, and I wanted to do a project that reflected that spookiness, but also reflected something that I found really interesting and kind of exciting. Currently, at the time of filming, my sewing an authentic Japanese kimono video has almost a thousand views, which in comparison to many YouTubers, doesn't really seem like a lot, but to me, that is an insanely incomprehensible number that almost a thousand people watched that video. It just, it, it baffles me. The fact that people are watching that made me want to kind of do a spooky themed kimono video to kind of cap off the end of October, not only satisfy my spooky desires, but merge my spooky desires and my kimono desires into one video. So, I will be making a not only a kimono, but an obi, an obijime, an obiage, and a hanari. Which, if you don't know what those are, don't worry, I will cover them and like the technical mumbo jumbo that goes along with it later in the video. With that being said, I am tired of talking and I'd like the spooky kimono fun to begin now, yes please? So, let's get into the video now. I found this amazing yokai fabric. I'm not sure if it's a dodomeki or a mokumokuren, but I knew that it would be perfect for my Halloween-themed kimono. And now, it's time for yokai fun facts! Dodomeki translates roughly to hundred hundred eye or many eye demon. Typically, they are women, where due to their stealing habits, are cursed to have hundreds of tiny eyes sprout out from their body as they transform into this yokai. Fun fact, they are described as having long arms, which is also a Japanese figure of speech for someone who likes to steal. Mokumokuren also translates to many eye demon and it occurs when a shoji screen isn't properly cared for and becomes riddled with holes. If it isn't repaired, these creepy eyes will pop out of the holes and watch your every move. Which did you find more creepy? This has been your yokai fun fact. Okay, let's get back to the kimono. I measured out my height in inches, which is 64 inches, I made sure to be careful and only measure from the bottom of the actual design and not the weird white barcode area. Since a kimono is made of one piece of fabric, I needed to mark at the 64 inch point and folded it over to get a total of 128 inches, which is twice my height, and ta-da! Now you have the front and back panels. I flipped the fabric over, and then I began to measure for the width of the kimono, which is 27 inches for me. In order to get your specific kimono sizing, I would highly recommend checking out Billy Matsunaga's video on how to make an authentic kimono, as well as her newest video, which is all about kimono sizing and measuring. It's very, very useful. Once everything was all cut out, I then pinned the katayama and basted it really quickly, and then gave it a once-over with my iron, just so I wouldn't lose it later on in the sewing process. I then unfolded the panels and then folded them horizontally. Next, I measure three centimeters into the back panel from the katayama, and this will be the point where we stop cutting the front panel open. Then I cut along the fold on the front panel to get the two front panels. Next, I start pinning along the back panels. This is where we're going to make our back seam. I'm doing it Billy Matsunaga's way, and not like I did the last way where I had two pieces of fabric. This time, it's just one piece of fabric, and we're just going to stitch over it to make it look like we have a back seam, even though we really don't. So remember that three centimeter measurement we took from the katayama? At that point, we're gonna measure nine centimeters horizontally into the back panel, and we're going to cut that open. Mm -hmm. 
Now I'm measuring 13 inches from the back seam. These markings are essentially creating our line marks for where we will be stitching our side seams together. Now that we've got that all measured out, it's time to flip it over again and line up all the panels nice and neat. I pin the two front and back panels together on both sides and then I sew them together. I press the back seam and the side seams just to make sure they're good and pressed. Here's a quick in progress shot. If you're following along for the second time, this is roughly what your kimono should look like at this point. We got the side seams, and now we are going to be cutting and sewing on the okumi. So, you'll want to have the wrong side of your kimono fabric facing up, and then measure 11 inches from your side seam to create the point where you will be sewing on the okumi onto the front panel. Now it was time to cut out the okumi panels. The okumi length is 15 centimeters shorter than your height. For me, that is 150 centimeters, and the width just needs to be 15 centimeters. Once I measured and marked this out, I cut it, and then I cut over the fold to get my two okumi panels. Next, I got everything ready to sew the okumi onto the kimono. I made sure to put the right side of the kimono fabric onto the right side of the okumi fabric and to follow along that line that I drew on the back of the fabric on the front panel as my pinning guide. Here it is from the other side so you can see it a little bit better. Again, here's the line that I'm going to use as my pinning guide, and I then made sure to line up the fabric of the okumi to the pattern fabric side of the kimono so that it didn't overlap with this white bit here, which I plan on folding into itself to create the hem of the bottom layer of the kimono. Once everything was pinned on, I sewed it, and the okumi is now finished. Here is roughly what your kimono should look like if you are following along at this point. We've sewn the side seams, we've sewn the okumi, now we are ready to press some seams and add some sleeves. In order to protect these seams a little bit more, I'm encapsulating the seams. So the smaller seam here, I wrap the larger one around it, press it down, 
and then do just a really quick felling stitch over it to make sure it stays secure in the kimono. I only did intermittent felling stitches for this because of the pattern I only wanted to sew over the dark purple areas that I had a thread match for. So instead of doing it the entire length like I did my last one, I only did a few spots. Next I did the same thing to the side seams, I encapsulated them and gave them a good press. Next, I folded and prepped the area on the inside of the kimono where the sleeve is going to attach. I just folded it so it matched the width of the inner side seam and gave it a quick iron. I then measured 23 centimeters from the katayama. This point I pinned on both pieces of fabric. This is where the sleeves are going to attach in the kimono. Next, it was time to actually cut the sleeves themselves. For the sleeve measurements, the sleeve is 19 inches long and 14 inches wide. Once I measured and traced along those lines, I then cut out the first sleeve. After cutting out the first sleeve, I just plopped that onto the fabric and cut out a second sleeve using that first one as a guide. Then I pinned the corners of both sleeves. Next I drew out a half an inch sewing allowance along the corner edge. And then I drew my tamoto. I then measured it to 23 centimeters from the top of the sleeve and pinned it. This is where we are going to attach the sleeves. I then pinned the rest of the areas of the sleeve that were going to be sewn and sewed it. I then cut off the excess fabric with scissors. You can do this with pinking shears though if you have them. And then I marked out about half an inch of an allowance on the other side of the sleeve for where we will attach the sleeve to the kimono. I then ironed the seam just for good measure. I then rolled this part of the sleeve and hemmed it. This is the part of the kimono where your arm comes out of and it's just nice to have it nice and neatly seamed. Next, I just did a quick rolled hem on the part of the sleeve that we will be attaching to the kimono so everything stays nice and neat. Again, the felling stitch I did was only on the dark parts of the pattern. Now we are ready to finally attach the sleeves. I wanted to make sure everything was folded nice and neat and was ready for attaching. This I showed in my last video. Essentially, you're taking your hands and putting them inside the kimono, there's my hand, and grabbing the sleeve at the same area point, roughly. So this is me grabbing the top, and then from the inside, my second hand grabs around the 23 centimeter pin mark. You grab it like so, and then you flip the whole thing inside out. It's a little messy, and so once you flip it inside out, just make sure that everything lines up and is neat, and you should see that your 23 centimeter marking pins all line up. Then I pinned the kimono fabric to the sleeve fabric.
and then I sewed it. At the 23 centimeter mark, I made sure to sew a little bit horizontally just to reinforce the bond. Then I ironed the seams. And now, this is what your kimono should roughly look like with sleeves. Not bad, not bad. Last for the kimono, it is finally time to do the collar. The Japanese kimono collar is made up of two pieces of fabric. The first one is two meters long and 17 centimeters wide, and the second one that goes on top is 90 centimeters long and also 17 centimeters wide. So I measured the last strip of fabric I had with these two measurements and got the long collar and short collar, measured them, and cut them. Next, I folded over both pieces of fabric, the long collar and the short collar, so I could get the middle point. I then pinned at this middle point so I knew where the middle was on both collars. I then laid the short collar on top of the long collar, matching up the middle points, and then I pinned where the short collar ended onto the long collar. I then flipped the short collar fabric over so that it ended on the other side of the pins, and then I pinned it onto the long collar. This is where you will sew the short collar on top of the long collar. I flipped the short collar back over, and now you've got this nice folded edge. I did the same thing on the other side. Now it is time to attach the collar to the kimono. I measured out 23 centimeters from the katayama to get the kensaki point, which is where the collar will attach to the okumi line. From there I measured the diagonal point, which was around 22 inches long, and made sure that it was the same measurements on the opposite side. From there, I drew a one centimeter sewing allowance onto the collar. I then marked the middle point and then drew 10 centimeter points on either side and drew a curve to connect the two. I then measured 11 centimeters into the collar, marked those points and did the same thing a little bit higher. About 25 centimeters from the end of the first markings, I did 13 centimeters into the collar and connected those lines. And then I did the same thing at the end of the collar, but I went in 15 centimeters and then connected those lines. I then repeated the process on the other side. To attach the collar to the kimono, I lined up the middle marking to the back seam and pinned that, and then I pinned both of those side markings, those 10 centimeter side markings, pulled the fabric taut, and pinned those in as my baseline pins. I then pinned the rest of the collar onto the kimono. Honestly, this is by far, other than sewing, one of the trickier parts of kimono construction, at least in my opinion. I kind of built up a system for myself where I would pin through the back area and then make sure that those lines lined up with the line on the collar. Here's what I mean. So here's the line that I drew on the collar and these are the pins that I've already pinned in. And as I flip it over, you can see this line on the back where I pinned in pins. So I would pin in a pin from the back to the front of the collar and then make sure that that all lined up and then pin it in officially 
the collar on top. I then sewed the collar on by machine this time instead of by hand, and honestly, the results weren't too bad. There were no weird lumps. Uh, it just took a little bit longer than normal. Next, I ironed along this point in the collar that I had drawn on previously, so I just folded the fabric along that line and ironed it down. Next, I added this small strip of fabric to the center back of the collar and I tied it into the kimono with a simple basting stitch. This is just to reinforce the collar and to protect the fabric. Now you're going to have some of this excess okumi fabric. You're going to want to cut this off, otherwise the kimono collar is going to be really bulky. Next, I folded over the kimono collar and started pinning it in place, getting prepped for sewing. Again, the sewing that I did for the collar was just a simple felled stitch, and I only felled it in the places that had the dark purple fabric that matched the thread color that I was using at the time. I should have done this earlier, but I forgot, but now I am going to hem the side edges and bottom edges of the okumi and then cut off some of the excess white fabric on the bottom and give the bottom a quick hem. Now it is time to make the obi. I'm using this Nagoya obi that I got from 3 Magpie Studio. It is my favorite obi of all time and I'm measuring the length and the width of the obi. Specifically the width, I wanted to use this thicker part for the width of the entire obi so that it's kind of like a maru obi, I think. The length was about 4 yards and the width I wanted was about 12 inches, so I measured it at 12 and a half inches so I have enough for seam allowance. I marked out and measured one panel, I then did the same thing for the second panel, measuring initially from the line that I drew from the first panel. I started from the 13 inch point and then drew a marking at the 12 and a half inch point, and then marked out the rest. Next, I put the right sides of the fabric together and lined them up as best as possible. I then sewed along this bottom edge and the two long edges. Pretty much, I sewed three of the four edges of the obi. I then pinned everything into place, and then gave it a quick sew. After sewing, I just wanted to iron the fabric really quick to prepare for the interfacing since the fabric was a little wrinkly, and I cut off this excess strip on the side that I didn't need. The type of interfacing I was using was a semi-lightweight uh, fusible interlining. I pinned it onto the fabric and then followed the ironing instructions, which were a little different from what I've done in the past. It required this like damp towel cloth type of fusing, so just make sure to follow whatever you're interlinings instructions are. Next, I folded the OB inside out. Once I got everything to lay flat in the way it needed to, I took the still open end on the other side of the OB and folded the ends into the inside. 
and then all I did was a simple fell stitch to close the seam. Now that the OB is all done, it's just time to make the Han Eri, which is a 16 centimeter wide piece of fabric that is 70 centimeters long that you cover the collar of your Nagajuban with. Essentially, it adds some extra flair, some color, a change of pattern to create really cool coordinations with your kimono stylings. Once everything was marked and measured out, I then cut it. And here you go! Next, it was time to make the obiage, which is about 70 inches long and about 12 inches wide. And the obiage is essentially another decorative kimono piece, but it also helps to cover the makura obi or obi pillow. To make the obijime, I'm going to do some macrame style weaving uh, that you can see here on this obi belt that I'm using as a size reference. I haven't done any macrame weaving since maybe elementary school summer camp, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. I'm going to be using this yellow gold rat tail cord. Since this is all one string, it's 13 meters of rat tail cording. I need to size it to this obijime. So what I'm going to do is run strips and I'll probably leave them just a little bit longer than this assuming that it will they will shorten when I weave. So I'll do maybe an inch or two past the ends. Um, I'm fine with having a slightly longer obijime and then we'll get to weaving. Now that all of the pieces are cut, I line up the ends and then I push them through with a safety pin. This is so that everything stays nice and neat and in the right order. And with the use of more safety pins, I was able to keep the cording taut and secured to a pillow so that none of the cords would move while weaving. Now that everything is tight and secure, it is time to start weaving. I take the outer piece and flip it over the second piece and under the last two, and then I just essentially repeat that step after tightening the cords on the opposite side. Uh, since this was my first foray back into some sort of like bracelet cord weaving since fourth grade summer camp, uh, it took me a little while to get the hang of things and I'm pausing every now and then to make sure that I don't mess up. But once you get the hang of it, it's really not that difficult to replicate. Um, it just takes a little bit of time, some patience and attention. And this is the final braid. Honestly, I think it looks really great for our first time macrame since the fourth grade summer camp. Um, all that was really left to do was to secure the ends together and then to fray the ends with a needle to get that fluffy obijime look. Um, in order to secure the ends, I took things off of the safety pins and then just kind of haphazardly sewed different cord bits together until everything felt tight and secure. Then I took the remaining thread that I had on the needle and wrapped it around the end nice and tight until everything felt really tight and secure and then just tied off the thread with a double knot. And that's it! Oh,
this is the final result. I think everything turned out really amazing and I learned a lot on this sewing adventure. I know what I would do differently next time. I think I would make the interfacing a little bit thicker in the OB so it's a bit stiffer. And I think I'd like to make one that's in that lime green color that the Obiage is made out of, just because I think it goes a little bit better with the purple kimono. I feel so spooky and wonderful in this kimono and I can't wait to wear it out for the rest of October and into November to keep the spooky vibes going or just when I need a spooky pick-me-up any time throughout the year. Thank you so much for watching and for joining me on this spooky sewing kimono adventure. I hope you had fun or at the very least learned something new or are excited to try something that you saw in this video. If you do, please let me know in the comments below. I'm really excited to see how everyone's obijime or spooky kimono turns out. Also, since we did cover some yokai in this video, which arguably is one of my favorite parts of Japanese culture, please let me know in the comments what your favorite yokai is. I'm very curious to know. Everyone kind of has their own favorite, and I feel like it says a little bit about a person who their favorite yokai is. With that being said, that is all I have for this particular spooky adventure. If you enjoyed watching the video, please be sure to give it a like. And if you'd like to follow me on more of my random crafting and DIY endeavors, you can subscribe to this channel or you can follow me at my Instagram in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. Have a amazingly magical, wonderful, spooky Halloween, and I will see you all next time.